Amen. Recording by Paul Adams. Chapter 7. Concerning new principalities, which were acquired either by the arms of others or by good fortune. Those who solely by good fortune become princes from being private citizens have little trouble in rising, but much in keeping atop. They have not any difficulties on the way up, because they fly, but they have many when they reach the summit. Such are those to whom some state is given either for money or by the favour of him who bestows it, as happened to many in Greece, in the cities of Ionia and of the Hellespont, where princes were made by Darius, in order that they might hold the cities both for his security and his glory as also were those emperors who, by the corruption of the soldiers, from being citizens, came to empire. Such stand simply elevated upon the good will and the fortune of him who has elevated them, two most inconstant and unstable things. Neither have they the knowledge requisite for the position, because, unless they are men of great worth and ability, it is not reasonable to expect that they should know how to command, having always lived in a private condition. Besides, they cannot hold it, because they have not forces which they can keep friendly and faithful. States that rise unexpectedly, then, like all other things in nature which are born and grow rapidly, cannot leave their foundations and correspondences. Footnote. Le radici e correspondenzi, their roots, i.e. foundations and correspondences or relations with other states, a common meaning of correspondence and correspondency in the 16th and 17th centuries, cannot leave their foundations and correspondences fixed in such a way that the first storm will not overthrow them, unless, as is said, those who unexpectedly become princes are men of so much ability that they know they have to be prepared at once to hold that which fortune has thrown into their laps, and that those foundations which others have laid before they became princes, they must lay afterwards. Concerning these two methods of rising to be a prince by ability or fortune, I wish to adduce two examples within our own recollection, and these are Francesco Sforza, Footnote. Francesco Sforza, born 1401, died 1466. He married Bianca Maria Visconti, a natural daughter of Filippo Visconti, the Duke of Milan, on whose death he procured his own elevation to the duchy. Machiavelli was the accredited agent of the Florentine Republic to Cesare Borgia, 1478 to 1507, during the transactions which led up to the assassinations of the Orsini and Vitelli at Sinigalia, and along with his letters to his chiefs in Florence, he has left an account, written ten years before the prince, of the proceedings of the duke in his Descrizioni del Modo Tenuto, dal duca Valentino Nello Amazzare Vitellozzo Vitelli etc., a translation of which is appended to the present work. I wish to adduce two examples within our own recollection, and these are Francesco Sforza and Cesare Borgia. Francesco, by proper means and with great ability, from being a private person, rose to be Duke of Milan, and that which he had acquired with a thousand anxieties he kept with little trouble. On the other hand, Cesare Borgia, called by the people Duke Valentino, acquired his state during the ascendancy of his father, and on its decline he lost it, notwithstanding that he had taken every measure and done all that ought to be done by a wise and able man to fix firmly his roots in the states which the arms and fortunes of others had bestowed on him. Because, as is stated above, he who has not first laid his foundations may be able with great ability to lay them afterwards, but they will be laid with trouble to the architect and danger to the building. 
if, therefore, all the steps taken by the duke be considered, it will be seen that he laid solid foundations for his future power, and I do not consider it superfluous to discuss them, because I do not know what better precepts to give a new prince than the example of his actions, and if his dispositions were of no avail, that was not his fault, but the extraordinary and extreme malignity of fortune. Alexander the Sixth, in wishing to aggrandize the Duke, his son, had many immediate and prospective difficulties. Firstly, he did not see his way to make him master of any state that was not a state of the church, and if he was willing to rob the church, he knew that the Duke of Milan and the Venetians would not consent, because Faenza and Rimini were already under the protection of the Venetians. Besides this, he saw the arms of Italy, especially those by which he might have been assisted, in hands that would fear the aggrandizement of the Pope, namely, the Orsini and the Colonnesi and their following. It behoved him, therefore, to upset this state of affairs and embroil the powers, so as to make himself securely master of part of their states. This was easy for him to do because he found the Venetians, moved by other reasons, inclined to bring back the French into Italy. He would not only not oppose this, but he would render it more easy by dissolving the former marriage of King Louis. Therefore the king came into Italy with the assistance of the Venetians and the consent of Alexander. He was no sooner in Milan than the Pope had soldiers from him for the attempt on the Romagna, which yielded to him on the reputation of the king. The Duke, therefore, having acquired the Romagna and beaten the Colonnesi, while wishing to hold that and to advance further, was hindered by two things. The one, his forces did not appear loyal to him, the other, the goodwill of France. That is to say, he feared that the forces of the Orsini, which he was using, would not stand to him that not only might they hinder him from winning more, but might themselves seize what he had won, and that the king might also do the same. Of the Orsini he had a warning, when, after taking Faenza and attacking Bologna, he saw them go very unwillingly to that attack. And as to the king, he learned his mind when he himself, after taking the duchy of Urbino, attacked Tuscany, and the king made him desist from that undertaking. Hence the duke decided to depend no more upon the arms and the luck of others. For the first thing he weakened the Orsini and Colonnesi parties in Rome by gaining to himself all their adherents who were gentlemen, making them his gentlemen, giving them good pay, and according to their rank honouring them with office and command in such a way that in a few months all attachment to the factions was destroyed and turned entirely to the duke. After this he awaited an opportunity to crush the Orsini, having scattered the adherents of the Colonna house. This came to him soon, and he used it well. For the Orsini, perceiving at length that the aggrandizement of the Duke and the Church was ruined to them, called a meeting of the Magioni in Perugia. From this sprung the rebellion at Urbino, and the tumults in the Romagna, with endless dangers to the Duke, all of which he overcame with the help of the French. Having restored his authority, not to leave it at risk by trusting either to the French or other outside forces, he had recourse to his wiles, and he knew so well how to conceal his mind that, by the mediation of Signor Pagolo, whom the Duke did not fail to secure with all kinds of attention, giving him money, apparel, and horses, the Orsini were reconciled, so that their simplicity brought them into his power at Sinegalia. Footnote, Sinegalia, 31st December 1502 
Having exterminated the leaders and turned their partisans into his friends, the duke laid sufficiently good foundations to his power, having all the Romagna and the Duchy of Urbino, and the people now beginning to appreciate the prosperity, he gained them all over to himself. And as this point is worthy of notice, and to be imitated by others, I am not willing to leave it out. When the Duke occupied the Romagna, he found it under the rule of weak masters, who rather plundered their subjects than ruled them, and gave them more cause for disunion than for union, so that the country was full of robbery, quarrels, and every kind of violence. And so, wishing to bring back peace and obedience to authority, he considered it necessary to give it a good governor. Thereupon he promoted Messer Romero d'Orco. Footnote. Romero d'Orco. Romero de Lorca. Therefore he promoted Messer Romero d'Orco, a swift and cruel man, to whom he gave the fullest power. This man, in a short time, restored peace and unity with the greatest success. Afterwards the Duke considered that it was not advisable to confer such excessive authority, for he had no doubt but that he would become odious, so he set up a court of judgment in the country, under a most excellent precedent, wherein all cities had their advocates." and because he knew that the past severity had caused some hatred against himself so to clear himself in the minds of the people and gain them entirely to himself he desired to show that if any cruelty had been practised it had not originated with him but in the natural sternness of the minister under this pretense he took Romero, and one morning caused him to be executed, and left on the piazza at Cesena with the block and a bloody knife at his side. The barbarity of this spectacle caused the people to be at once satisfied and dismayed. But let us return whence we started. I say that the Duke, finding himself now sufficiently powerful and partly secured from immediate dangers by having armed himself in his own way, and having in a great measure crushed those forces in his vicinity that could injure him if he wished to proceed with his conquest, had next to consider France, for he knew that the King, who too late was aware of his mistake, would not support him and from this time he began to seek new alliances and to temporize with france in the expedition which she was making towards the kingdom of naples against the spaniards who were besieging gaeta it was his intention to secure himself against them and this he would have quickly accomplished had alexander lived such was his line of action as to present affairs but as to the future he had to fear in the first place that a new successor to the church might not be friendly to him and might seek to take from him that which alexander had given him so he decided to act in four ways firstly by exterminating the families of those lords whom he had despoiled so as to take away that pretext from the pope secondly by winning to himself all the gentlemen of rome so as to be able to curb the pope with their aid as has been observed thirdly by converting the college more to himself Fourthly, by acquiring so much power before the Pope should die, that he could by his own measures resist the first shock. Of these four things, at the death of Alexander, he had accomplished three, for he had killed as many of the dispossessed lords as he could lay hands on, and few had escaped. He had won over the Roman gentlemen, and he had the most numerous party in the college and as to any fresh acquisition he intended to become master of tuscany for he already possessed perugia and piombino and pisa was under his protection 
and as he had no longer to study France, for the French were already driven out of the kingdom of Naples by the Spaniards, and in this way both were compelled to buy his good will, he pounced down upon Pisa. After this, Luca and Siena yielded at once, partly through hatred and partly through fear of the Florentines, and the Florentines would have had no remedy had he continued to prosper, as he was prospering the year that Alexander died, for he had acquired so much power and reputation that he would have stood by himself, and no longer had depended on the luck and the forces of others, but solely on his own power and ability." But Alexander died five years after he had first drawn the sword. He left the duke with the state of Romagna alone consolidated, with the rest in the air, between two most powerful hostile armies, and sick unto death. Yet there were in the duke such boldness and ability, and he knew so well how men are to be won or lost, and so firm were the foundations which in so short a time he had laid, that if he had not had those armies on his back, or if he had been in good health, he would have overcome all difficulties. And it is seen that his foundations were good, for the Romagna awaited him for more than a month. In Rome, although but half alive, he remained secure, and whilst the Baglioni, the Vitelli, and the Orsini might come to Rome, they could not effect anything against him. If he could not have made Pope him whom he wished, at least the one whom he did not wish would not have been elected. But if he had been in sound health at the death of Alexander, footnote, Alexander the Sixth died of fever, 18th August, 1503. But if he had been in sound health at the death of Alexander, everything would have been different to him. On the day that Julius the Second, footnote, Julius the Second was Giuliano della Rovere, Cardinal of San Pietro ad Vincula, born 1443, died 1513. On the day that Julius the Second was elected, he told me that he had thought of everything that might occur at the death of his father, and had provided a remedy for all, except that he had never anticipated that, when the death did happen, he himself would be on the point to die. When all the actions of the Duke are recalled, I do not know how to blame him, but rather it appears to be, as I have said, that I ought to offer him for imitation to all those who, by the fortune or the arms of others, are raised to government, because he, having a lofty spirit and far-reaching aims, could not have regulated his conduct otherwise and only the shortness of the life of Alexander and his own sickness frustrated his designs. Therefore, he who considers it necessary to secure himself in his new principality, to win friends, to overcome either by force or fraud, to make himself beloved and feared by the people, to be followed and revered by the soldiers, to exterminate those who have power or reason to hurt him, to change the old order of things for new, to be severe and gracious, magnanimous and liberal, to destroy a disloyal soldiery and to create new, to maintain friendship with kings and princes in such a way that they must help him with zeal and offend with caution, cannot find a more lively example than the actions of this man. Only can he be blamed for the election of Julius the Second, in whom he made a bad choice, because, as is said, not being able to elect a pope to his own mind, he could have hindered any other from being elected pope, and he ought never to have consented to the election of any cardinal whom he had injured, or who had cause to fear him if they became pontiffs, for men injure either from fear or hatred. Those whom he had injured, amongst others, were San Pietro ad Vincula, Colonna, San Giorgio, and Ascanio. Footnote. 
San Giorgio is Raffaello Riario. Ascanio is Ascanio Sforza. The rest, in becoming Pope, had to fear him, Rouen and the Spaniards excepted, the latter from their relationship and obligations, the former from his influence, the kingdom of France having relations with him. Therefore, above everything, the duke ought to have created a Spaniard Pope, and, failing him, he ought to have consented to Rouen and not San Pietro ad Vincula. He who believes that new benefits will cause great personages to forget old injuries is deceived. Therefore the duke erred in his choice, and it was the cause of his ultimate ruin. Chapter 8 Concerning Those Who Have Obtained a Principality by Wickedness Although a prince may rise from a private station in two ways, neither of which can be entirely attributed to fortune or genius, yet it is manifest to me that I must not be silent on them, although one could be more copiously treated when I discuss republics. These methods are when, either by some wicked or nefarious ways, one ascends to the principality or when by the favour of his fellow-citizens a private person becomes the prince of his country and speaking of the first method it will be illustrated by two examples one ancient the other modern and without entering further into the subject i consider these two examples will suffice those who may be compelled to follow them agathocles the sicilian footnote Agathocles the Sicilian, born 361 B.C., died 289 B.C. Agathocles the Sicilian became king of Syracuse, not only from a private, but from a low and abject position. This man, the son of a potter, through all the changes in his fortunes, always led an infamous life. Nevertheless, he accompanied his infamies with so much ability of mind and body that, having devoted himself to the military profession, he rose through its ranks to be praetor of Syracuse. Being established in that position, and having deliberately resolved to make himself prince, and to seize by violence, without obligation to others, that which had been conceded to him by assent, he came to an understanding for this purpose with Amilcar the Carthaginian, who, with his army, was fighting in Sicily. One morning he assembled the people and the Senate of Syracuse, as if he had to discuss with them things relating to the Republic, and at a given signal the soldiers killed all the senators and the richest of the people. These dead he seized and held the princedom of that city without any civil commotion and although he was twice routed by the carthaginians and ultimately besieged yet not only was he able to defend his city but leaving part of his men for its defence with the others he attacked africa and in a short time raised the siege of syracuse the carthaginians reduced to extreme necessity were compelled to come to terms with agathocles and leaving sicily to him had to be content with the possession of africa therefore he who considers the actions and the genius of this man will see nothing or little which can be attributed to fortune inasmuch as he attained pre-eminence as is shown above not by the favour of any one but step by step in the military profession which steps were gained with a thousand troubles and perils and were afterwards boldly held by him with many hazardous dangers yet it cannot be called talent to slay fellow-citizens to deceive friends to be without faith without mercy without religion such methods may gain empire but not glory 
Still, if the courage of Agathocles in entering into and extricating himself from dangers be considered, together with his greatness of mind in enduring and overcoming hardships, it cannot be seen why he should be esteemed less than the most notable captain. Nevertheless, his barbarous cruelty and inhumanity with infinite wickedness do not permit him to be celebrated among the most excellent men. What he achieved cannot be attributed either to fortune or genius. In our times, during the rule of Alexander the Sixth. Oliverotto de Fermo, having been left an orphan many years before, was brought up by his maternal uncle Giovanni Fogliani, and in the early days of his youth sent to fight under Pagolo Vitelli, that, being trained under his discipline, he might attain some high position in the military profession. After Pagolo died, he fought under his brother Vitellozzo and in a very short time being endowed with wit and a vigorous body and mind he became the first man in his profession but it appearing a paltry thing to serve under others he resolved with the aid of some citizens of fermo to whom the slavery of their country was dearer than its liberty and with the help of the vitelleschi to seize fermo so he wrote to Giovanni Fogliani that, having been away from home for many years, he wished to visit him in his city, and in some measure to look upon his patrimony. And although he had not laboured to acquire anything except honour, yet, in order that the citizen should see he had not spent his time in vain, he desired to come honourably, so would be accompanied by one hundred horsemen, his friends and retainers. And he entreated Giovanni to arrange that he should be received honourably by the Fermians, all of which would be not only to his honour, but also to that of Giovanni himself, who had brought him up. Giovanni, therefore, did not fail in any attentions due to his nephew, and he caused him to be honourably received by the Fermians, and he lodged him in his own house, where, having passed some days, and having arranged what was necessary for his wicked designs, Oliverotto gave a solemn banquet, to which he invited Giovanni Fogliani and the chiefs of Fermo. When the viands and all the other entertainments that are usual in such banquets were finished, Oliverotto artfully began certain grave discourses, speaking of the greatness of Pope Alexander and his son Cesare, and of their enterprises, to which discourse Giovanni and others answered. But he rose at once, saying that such matters ought to be discussed in a more private place and he betook himself to a chamber whither giovanni and the rest of the citizens went in after him no sooner were they seated than soldiers issued from secret places and slaughtered giovanni and the rest after these murders oliverotto mounted on horseback rode up and down the town and besieged the chief magistrate in the palace so that in fear the people were forced to obey him and to form a government of which he made himself the prince he killed all the malcontents who were able to injure him and strengthened himself with new civil and military ordinances in such a way that in the year during which he held the principality not only was he secure in the city of fermo but he had become formidable to all his neighbours and his destruction would have been as difficult as that of Agathocles if he had not allowed himself to be overreached by Cesare Borgia, who took him with the Orsini and Vitelli at Sinegalia, as was stated above. Thus, one year after he had committed this parricide, he was strangled, together with Vitelloso, whom he had made his leader in valour and a wickedness. 
Some may wonder how it can happen that Agathocles and his like, after infinite treacheries and cruelties, should live for long secure in his country, and defend himself from external enemies, and never be conspired against by his own citizens, seeing that many others, by means of cruelty, have never been able, even in peaceful times, to hold the state, still less in the doubtful times of war. I believe that this follows from severities. Footnote. Mr. Bird suggests that this word probably comes near the modern equivalent of Machiavelli's thought when he speaks of crudelta than the more obvious cruelties. I believe that this follows from severities being badly or properly used. Those may be called properly used, is of evil it is possible to speak well, that are applied at one blow, and are necessary to one's security, and that are not persisted in afterwards, unless they can be turned to the advantage of the subjects. The badly employed are those which, notwithstanding they may be few in the commencement, multiply with time rather than decrease. Those who practice the first system are able, by aid of God or man, to mitigate in some degree their rule, as Agathocles did. It is impossible for those who follow the other to maintain themselves. Hence it is to be remarked that, in seizing a state, the usurper ought to examine closely into all those injuries which it is necessary for him to inflict, and to do them all at one stroke, so as not to have to repeat them daily, and thus by not unsettling men he will be able to reassure them, and win them to himself by benefits." He who does otherwise, either from timidity or evil advice, is always compelled to keep the knife in his hand. Neither can he rely on his subjects, nor can they attach themselves to him, owing to their continued and repeated wrongs. For injuries ought to be done all at one time, so that, being tasted less, they offend less. Benefits ought to be given little by little, so that the flavour of them may last longer. And above all things a prince ought to live amongst his people in such a way that no unexpected circumstances, whether of good or evil, shall make him change, because if the necessity for this comes in troubled times, you are too late for harsh measures, and mild ones will not help you, for they will be considered as forced from you, and no one will be under any obligation to you for them. End of chapter 8. Recording by Paul Adams, www.yawnguy.com.